I would say that my experience at Cornell has a lot to do with, with who I am today. And I was probably shaped more profoundly by the experiences there than by anything that happened to me in the rest of my life, both before and after. I'm glad I went to Cornell. I'm Jane Brody, CALS. When I was four years old, I announced to my father that I wanted to be a veterinarian. And my father, in his own wisdom, said, Cornell has a college of veterinary medicine. And so I decided at four that I was going to go to Cornell and become a vet. My father was a Cornellian, and of course that is why he knew about Cornell's College of Veterinary Medicine. My father was the class of 31. I was a speaker at his 50th reunion. Just absolute coincidence that I was asked to speak at that reunion, and there he was with my stepmother in the audience. It was wonderful. Hi, I'm Shara Jones Collister, Hotel School. When I was a sophomore in high school, uh, my parents and my brother and I made a trip to Cornell for him to consider as a place to matriculate. And I fell in love with Cornell then. Uh, one of the most wonderful things was that uh, once I was accepted, which was wonderful in itself, but I also received a full scholarship, tuition, room, and board. So that really made it uh, possible for me. It actually was the Maud Alice Palmer Scholarship. One day, my girlfriend and I cut a class in high school and went to her house and the mailman happened to be coming along and I said oh did you get any mail for me I'm down the block and they gave me this letter and it was my notice of a scholarship and it was like it was just unbelievable so I called my mom to tell her that I'd gotten this scholarship and she said where are you <laughs> I think it was the spring of 58 when uh, the students egged the president at Cornell and my parents said, you wouldn't want to go there, would you? And I said, oh yes, I would. <laughs> Jan McClayton Kreitz, Human Ecology. I came to Cornell because I was coming out of a large suburban Chicago high school and I wanted to go someplace that was bigger than my high school. I also wanted to go east to school, uh, which was east for me. But uh, I discovered when I got there that it was west for the people from Boston and New York. However, I went east to school. I wanted to go to some place with a non-urban campus. And I wanted to go to a co-ed school. In the late 50s, there weren't very many options. So I ended up at Cornell. I'm Mike Dusing, College of Engineering. My SATs were pretty high. So I could get into Cornell. They knew what my academic credentials were. And because I had an interest in some athletic ability, that was the path to have the alumni uh, draw me into a subfrosh weekend. Boy, what a beautiful campus. Broad education, uh, yet I could still get an engineering degree. My name is Harry Edwards. School of Industrial and Labor Relations. I came to Cornell um, at the suggestion of my mother. She was a psychiatric social worker. She came home one night and she said, I participated in a mediation. And we didn't know what that was. And she explained how the workers were having problems with managers. And there was a mediator who was apparently very effective in helping them settle their dispute. And she said, this person started talking about Cornell University and the School of Industrial and Labor Relations. She said, have you ever heard of it? So she said, well, you probably should think about going to Cornell. And that was really it. I'm Sam Fleming, chemical engineering. My junior year in high school, my chemistry teacher came over uh, after a lab and said, uh, have you ever thought anything about Cornell? He said, uh, there's a wonderful program that uh, sends students who are involved with chemistry to Cornell to look at their very special chemical engineering program. The result was a spring weekend trip in my junior year, and the rest was history. After that, I wanted to go to Cornell. My name is Clark Halstead, architecture. I had the idea that I needed to uh, depart from college 
with a marketable skill. Third year of high school, I had a mechanical drawing class with a um, uh, kind of a mentor, uh, you know, wise old teacher, and I was so fascinated by um, drawing pictures of houses and uh, other kind of mechanical things that um, I decided that architecture was the place for me. And I applied uh, to uh, Cornell and the University of Virginia and uh, one or two other five-year courses. I had a Regent scholarship uh, from the state of New York which paid, you know, part of the tuition. And so there was really no choice. It was a no-brainer. Cornell it was. I'm Alex Steinberg. I was in the Arts and Science School after a, a brief tenure in the Engineering School. At the time I was interested in engineering and I applied to, I, I guess it was four schools, uh, Harvard, Purdue, Lehigh, and Cornell. And they all had engineering schools. And uh, I didn't get into Harvard, but uh, I did get into the other three schools. And uh, I uh, wanted to have some background in liberal arts as well, so I ended up at Cornell. I'm George Tellish. I had 60 scholarships to colleges. And I, in my senior year in high school, I flew all over the country. Well, I, I chose to, to go to Cornell, even though I had appointments to all the academies, uh, because um, I wanted to go to an Ivy League school. Well, my parents took me to Cornell. Uh, driving from Chicago, dropped me off at Dixon 5, where I, where I moved in, and uh, enjoyed the experience so much that I was a VP the following year in Dixon 5. The rooms were mostly singles, so everybody was in the same boat of not having a roommate, and we had to go out and meet other people in the dorm and on the corridor. It was a surprise to see uh, the dorms and everybody coming from all over and you wondered and feeling a little bit lost as you meet your roommate and learn about uh, his world and the world of those on your corridor and you realized right out of the chute that uh, this was going to be a very different experience. I lived on a uh, corridor with uh, two or three other single rooms and then some bigger rooms at the end of the corridor. And one of the uh, rooms at the end of the corridor on the right was occupied by Cuban refugees. And they uh, loved uh, to uh, drink rum and smoke cigars in that room down there and play large, loud Cuban music. And um, it was, um, well, what shall I say, a cultural awakening for me. In the wintertime, it was so cold. There was no, no heat coming down to the end. I had to call my brother in, in Clifton, New Jersey to send me a heater. So when I came as a freshman, I was uh, assigned to Risley. We had uh, weekly meetings of the quarter where our VPs and AVPs would um, give us information about how to live properly. Uh, we were not allowed to go to any apartments because uh, it was against the rules, uh, which most of us broke. I lived in Risley my freshman year, and uh, we had a wonderful corridor. I sort of was the, the floor counselor, and, and everybody came to me with their problems. So I ended up having to post hours on my dormitory door so that I could get some studying done and still have time to help people when they needed help. You know, it wasn't an option in those days to live off campus if you were a female, but I wouldn't have wanted to do it because I think the dormitory experience was special. I had never experienced the kind of dining experience that we had as, as freshmen. We had gracious dining. Bowls of food were put on the table in front of us that everybody could eat and people were served. Um, and I grew up with the, in the mentality that said you never wasted any food. And so when there was food left in those bowls at the end of the meal, I ate it. So I gained that 10 pounds that I then had to spend the summer between freshman and sophomore year getting rid of. That was also the era of gracious living and the era of dress code. The women were allowed to bring one pair of pants 
for really cold days. And otherwise, we had to wear skirts. I just remember wearing skirts all the time. I mean, it was, I don't think I even owned a pair of jeans. We had curfews, uh, so we had to be in by 10 o'clock at night. Uh, we were punished if we did not make the curfew by being grounded and having to come in earlier. Where I went for all my meals as a freshman was, um, was the straight. They had newspapers on sticks, you know, in the old-fashioned library way, and I learned to enjoy reading the Times every day. Second semester, uh, we uh, went around to look at, I went around to look at fraternities, and uh, I was heavily influenced by my participation in wrestling because many of the wrestlers uh, went into uh, Todd Elba Phi. Now my uh, sophomore year, I uh, lived in the fraternity. I uh, pledged Kappa. I loved being in the sorority. Uh, I loved uh, eating there in the small group. We had about maybe 30 people who lived in the house. And uh, so it was, it was really a, a good experience. We always had a bridge game going. So if somebody had to go study, somebody else would come and take over so that we would never lose our continual bridge game. My last year, I lived in the DG house. It ended up that probably six or seven of us from two adjacent corridors and up in the same pledge class and have been close friends ever since. We had a house mother who was enjoying her social life in Ithaca, so she was not always there at come curfew time, but that was okay with us. I ended up uh, pledging Sigma Chi I lived uh, at Sigma Chi sophomore, junior, and senior years. Uh, got involved with the fraternity, was treasurer of the house, and really, really found the uh, living experience, the relationships, the friendships uh, made uh, an extra uh, positive dimension about Cornell. Our freshman year, there were 36 men who pledged Feigam in that one year which is, the, to this day, the largest uh, uh, pledge class. The fraternity uh, started first thing in the morning. There was always a breakfast crew. It was a great time. The Cornell Sun had been delivered. Everyone had certain items that they wanted to read about. Everything started at breakfast. Every, every night in Sigma Phi, it was coat and tie for dinner. The philosophy was that everybody lives in a house. The um, uh, idea of the, the whole fraternity was that you pick somebody that is totally opposite of you and then, you know, find out what the hell he's about, you know, and if you're living together, you have to find out what he's about. The time the year ended, you really were good friends. Fraternity life for me had one particularly special aspect. I was a great sleeper. I could go to sleep any time and I could stay asleep for a very long period. So I became known as the person in the fraternity that the pledges had to put not one person on to wake up me. They had to put two or three because I could fake that I was waking up and the next thing you know I had gone right back to sleep, slept through breakfast, and the first class. The DU fraternity was a place where I found uh, community and support and um, conversation and friendships. And what I remember uh, about it was uh, something in particular. I ate lunch there every day from sophomore through uh, year through fifth year. And it was a porch overlooking uh, the lake. And there were uh, wonderful rocking chairs with uh, big arms where uh, people for uh, decades had carved their initials. And there was a big coffee pot. And that was the uh, most pleasant and um, harmless uh, me memory that, that I have of the com comradeship there, drinking coffee on the terrace until we all had to go somewhere after lunch. When I joined A Pi, that helped the social scene a lot. The fraternity was a comfortable place. Uh, I stayed there my third year. 
and sort of uh, became a little bit of a bohemian. So I moved over to college town my uh, uh, junior year. My, my senior year, uh, when I double uh, registered in the graduate school, I was able to get into a graduate school dorm. And actually, I was very lucky because that was the first year when Sage uh, Hall was uh, uh, converted from a sophomore girls' dorm to a, uh, a graduate uh, a dorm for graduate students. So I was able to live on campus. <laughs> A um, perplexing and perhaps terrifying part of matriculation at Cornell was the matriculation uh, welcome to the uh, School of Architecture from the dean. Somewhere in his speech he said, look to your left and look to your right. Only one out of three of you will be uh, here at the end of five years. It was more like one out of five that was there at the end of five years. The class, 165 strong, was pulled together in the auditorium and we were told, uh, look to your left, look to your right, look in front of you, look in back of you. One of you will graduate from Cornell in chemical engineering. Uh, I love the hotel school curriculum because it had everything from business courses to um, liberal arts courses to um, cooking courses and uh, it just, it opened a whole new world for me. I was obviously a large minority and it really enabled me to learn how to deal with a lot of different people and particularly with uh, my male associates. Tony was the most fanatic uh, workaholic uh, student I've ever met in my life and he taught me how to study. He said, uh, Alex, he says, I'm going to teach you chemistry. You're going to get the second highest grade in all the chemistry class. He says, next to mine. And sure enough, I got something like a 98 in second semester chemistry, and of course he had a 99 or a 100. <laughs> what we did there uh, at the School of Architecture was intense discussion of aesthetics, um, and that was the chief feature of the design. You had to, you had to present verbally um, why it was that you designed what you did. I thought that the whole next school would be a good amalgam of everything that I enjoyed doing. I liked everything I was studying. I liked the social sciences as well as the physical sciences. My major was textiles, and I used that working for the Department of Agriculture's Research Service. But I, on the strength of one history class with Walter Lefebvre, I ended up teaching American world and European history in junior high and high school my first year out. So this would have been my senior year. And I, I'm afraid I probably introduced the Cornell grading system to that particular school and uh, did not fall for the dog ate my homework bit, which really happens. I had truly inspiring faculty mentors. Kurt Hanslow, who had a joint appointment in the Industrial and Labor Relations School and in the law school. And Jean McKelvey was one of the most important persons in my life. And she was one of the giants, uh, one of the best arbitrators in the world, and a wonderful teacher, and a wonderful mentor. Jean was spectacular. She was spectacular in the classroom. She was inspiring. She taught me labor arbitration, which is something I did for years after I left Cornell and finished law school. And Jean watched me throughout my entire career until she passed away. My fondest memories are of certain classes. Um, my botany class, uh, Harlan Banks was my professor. And I didn't know he was a world famous botanist at the time he was my professor, but I found out afterward. I liked the history, the correspondence uh, with Fred Marcham uh, in trying to get me started in, into academics at Cornell, so we corresponded while I was still in high school. He sent me various formats to review 
and to uh, send back a synopsis of what I think I read. I used to knit in class. In fact, the only, the lowest grades I got at Cornell were the classes in which the professor wouldn't let me knit. We just thought that we could do anything. We were all children of the 50s. We had grandfatherly Dwight Eisenhower in the presidency. I was elected vice president of the student government. And in fact, I faced a runoff. At the time of that election, they were building the addition to the library. And there was a big contractor's fence right in the main quadrangle, a huge fence. And Dave Slovic, my best friend and I, went out the night before and we had built these big block letters, Edwards, and we put it across the fence so that everyone going to class that day walked across the main quadrangle and saw the name Edwards. I was selected to host Martin Luther King when he came to campus. This was huge for me. I was standing next to one of the people who I think is one of the great men that I've ever known, heard of, been involved with. By my sophomore year, I decided I had to be something other than just a student. And I joined the Cornell Countryman, which was um, the magazine for the College of Agriculture and the College of Home Economics. It was a monthly. I figured I could work that into my horrific class schedule. I only had to write once a month. But by the end of my uh, sophomore year, I was an associate editor. And by the end of my junior year, I was editor in chief of this magazine. And I woke up in May of my junior year and I said, I love this. Why don't I do this? In my junior year, I was approached to co-chair the uh, freshman orientation program. And it turned out that uh, Nancy Schlegel Meinig, our uh, classmate, and I ended up as co-chairs. It started out as a dorm counselor because it was free room and you got a stipend. And then I was assistant head resident. I invented a recreation activity. We called it the murder ball. And we had a ball that was uh, six feet in diameter. I don't know how we came up with this, but um, we ordered and bought this ball. It took a long time to pump it up. And then between the university halls, we had uh, in the rain, in the mud, that was, wasn't planned for that, but we had this, essentially a soccer ball game that went at university halls from one end to the other. And I liked being a VP. I liked the, the freshman girls in uh, Risley that were on my corridor. It was a, a very high growth experience for me as well as for the freshmen. So I played in the freshman football team, but I was just too small. I became friends with Byron McCalman. And Byron said, cheer up, Mike. You're going to play football next year. We're going to be on the lightweight team. You have to make weight before each game at 154 pounds. You're going to be one of the big guys on this team. I played uh, uh, lightweight football, sophomore year, junior, senior year. It was, it was great fun. When I started wrestling at Cornell, I was in the 157 pound class, which uh, meant that I had to pull or lose a, a fair amount of weight each uh, match. That was in my sophomore year but it also aligned with my, the sprint football where I had to be down to 154 pounds each, each week. Uh, so a lot of my time I was spent dehydrating to get down to those weights. And uh, by the time I was in my junior and senior year, uh, I went up and wrestled heavier weights, which was 167 in some uh, cases 177, and that which was more, uh, which was closer to my normal body weight. The uh, freshman swimming team was one of the communities that I found uh, at Cornell, and we weren't very good, and, you know, we had some meets, and I don't think we ever won, and it didn't matter. It was because, um, you know, the uh, comradeship and, and the, um, uh, the, 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 the very difference of that activity from all of the academic stresses um, was a welcome relief. It was tough uh, at Cornell. From the freshman team to the sophomore year, we probably lost 80% of our players. They just busted out. I was injured at a Harvard game of my uh, 
senior, but I came back for the Dartmouth game. And I became um, the most valuable player at the Cornell and athlete of the year. And I also made, after scoring three touchdowns in the Cornell uh, Colgate game in the, in the senior year, I was also um, All East and Honorable Mention All America at Cornell. There were next to no minority students at the Ivy League schools. And so this was another thing that would give one pause if you're in my situation. Uh, and indeed, it proved to be uh, uh, a bit of a problem once you went there, uh, once I went there, because uh, the social life uh, was not what most people experienced. Because when you were a minority, there were no more than 10 African American students during the whole time that I was at Cornell. Um, which is quite astonishing when you think about it. Uh, that made social life very difficult because we did not have interracial dating in those days. I had met some impressive people from fraternities during freshman orientation. And I had decided, gee, I have to decide between and, uh, I don't know, a couple of others. Naive me, not understanding that if you're African American, uh, the chances of my going and other such fraternities was not small, it was zero. And I did not get that. Uh, it was quite an amazing experience as I sat in that room waiting to be rushed and initially being totally naive about the experience and being rushed by no one. Uh, I later came to find out that the only, only fraternities that might consider a person of my race were the Jewish fraternities, and then only a couple, and the year later I joined uh, A.E. Pi fraternity. But that first year, by virtue of that experience, was traumatic because the fact of my race um, became clear in my head. Uh, it was not something that I dwelled on because we weren't brought up that way. I had been raised in mixed communities, very, very proud of my own heritage but didn't think much about it. Uh, and I realized that Cornell, I looked around, I realized Cornell was not a place that knew much about people of my race and there were gonna be some challenges related to this. I had never spent so many hours uh, muddling along trying to just pass uh, as I did during my freshman year. And it was um, uh, painful, a rude awakening. And by the end, I wasn't sure if I was in the, uh, a place uh, where I could endure. I recall um, walking up the Live Slope one day in March um, after, you know, having been awake practically all night in my dorm room studying, and there was ice on the walks, and it had started to rain. And I got two-thirds of the way up the Live Slope to um, Sibley, and I fell, and I slid all the way back down. I could not stop myself until I ended up in the street because the sluicing water in this ice channel uh, caused that. And I got to the bottom and I said, well, this amplified my, my feeling of, uh, of uh, hopelessness about the uh, curriculum and my ability to deal with it. And it was a real, it was the very, very low point of my freshman year. Although my father was uh, in the investment business and sadly died uh, when uh, he was only 46 and I was only 12, I was uh, fortunate to get a, uh, a General Motors National Scholarship uh, to Cornell uh, that helped out a bit because uh, although we uh, were raised in a comfortable home, we really didn't have uh, the funds to, to take care of Cornell knowing it would be five years. It was, uh, it was a, a tough going. I got there, I had no money, my, my father was dead. And uh, of course, my mother didn't work. Any money I had was what I earned myself. I had uh, privileges for lunch and dinner at Statler Hotel. So I, I would go there for lunch and dinner. It was free for me. I would just go through the line and they'd just let me go through. And that was good uh, for the first year I was there. At the end of uh, 
uh, my semester in the Division on Classified Students, I, I got the grades, I got the, uh, had my 84 average. I applied for two scholarships and uh, was between semesters and I, I called from my home in Pennsylvania to see if I'd gotten such a, the scholarship that they told me I was probably going to get. And they had said that they would guarantee me if I got the, the 80, you know, over the 82, I would get the scholarship. And I called the person. I said, no, unfortunately, I hadn't gotten the scholarship. So, uh, so I assumed that I was out of Cornell. So I, I uh, went and enrolled in the local college, which was called Wilkes College in Wilkes-Barre, PA. And... Uh, uh, pretty much written Cornell off, and then my friend Milton Luhmann couldn't, uh, was uh, uh, more stubborn than I was and called them and found out that in fact there was a second scholarship that I'd been considered for and I had gotten the second scholarship and nobody at Cornell had told me that. And so I missed the first week of classes my uh, sophomore year, second semester, but I was back at Cornell. I worked in labs to earn some spending money. Um, and I spent very little. My mother died just before I graduated from high school, which left the family rather bereft of income. And um, there was no way that I was going to get to go to college without help. Um, it was very challenging. I was a national scholar, which didn't pay a lot of uh, money, but I had to work. So I always had a job, uh, and uh, one of the jobs I started off with was uh, being an assistant, uh, grading courses and doing labs for Bill Erickson in uh, electrical engineering. I also got recruited by electrical engineering to help run the high voltage lab experiment. I delivered newspapers. I delivered all the Cornell Daily Sun throughout the entire main part of the campus. Um, I was a waiter. I waited for almost all of my meals uh, from my sophomore year on. Sophomore year particularly times were tight and uh, uh, and uh, my, my father was out of a job uh, <laughs> and uh, so I had to work in addition and uh, so my uh, sophomore year I had two jobs uh, one at the uh, library and the other at the uh, hotel school as a uh, bellhop I'd work pretty close to full time, a 40 hour job my sophomore year. I had to work to put myself through school, so I was busy. I didn't have a lot of free time. I worked at Willard Strait Hall uh, at the front desk, which I thought was one of the greatest jobs, uh, especially after you waited tables and washed dishes. To be at the cash register at the counter at Willard Strait Hall was a terrific job. That was be like becoming executive vice president of a major corporation. <laughs> There was quite a crew that could party, and I will never forget, probably the most fun, interesting time, um, they, we had to have uh, chaperones, so I was a goody two-shoes, so they said, well, you know, who could we get? So they got me to get my folks to come on spring weekend. Uh, I was the social chairman, and I had a budget of $17,000 a year for booze, and if I ran out of money before spring weekend, I would have been skinned alive and hung from the oak. <laughs> and of course, spring weekend was when Figam had its Fiji Island party. Fiji, Figam, nothing to do with Fiji Islands, but just the alliteration of the letters. And of course, everyone would put on grease paint. And I will, I will never forget my parents uh, sitting in front of the fraternity house and here are all these kids, grease paint all over them. Um, and of course, political correctness didn't exist. I didn't hang out in the Ivy Room. And I can't tell you why I didn't do that. I, I didn't have time, or I'd study between classes. But I just said, I'd say, what's going on? What, oh, you met that person at the Ivy Room. I think the key time was in, at 10 o'clock in the morning. So that meant you had to have uh, an open uh, class schedule at 10. You would meet somebody and they'd offer you, uh, invite you to a coffee date and you would meet at the straight after a class or before another class and just simply sit there and talk and meet with other people and so it was just a social event without being really a date uh, and it was an opportunity to get to know people. I met Ed Goldman in 
Goldwyn Smith. I was in my sophomore year, the beginning of my sophomore year, and he must have been a junior. And uh, we remained girlfriend and boyfriend for the next three years. I wouldn't consider myself a party animal, but I would consider myself a social person. I went to all the parties. It was uh, four to one, uh, men to women. And uh, you really had to strategize, plan early, and uh, strike fast uh, to, to, to make sure you had a date for a major party weekend. We did have some, some weekends that we pilfered, there's no question about it. We went out and did some prowling around the other fraternities and took some stuff and brought them over to our, 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 our safe place, the chapter house. And you get into it, if you knew the combination, once you get in, it was absolutely astounding. And that's where all the stuff was stored. It was very exciting when Bo Diddley came to campus. And the party, as I recall, was organized by several fraternities. And we were fortunate enough to go and uh, learn some of these new dance steps that were coming in, like the twist which fit right in with the music, which we all really enjoyed. Saturday of spring weekend, Bo Diddley and his band were playing, and he came up and he rolled his uh, little truck onto the uh, front lawn at uh, Todd Elt, and uh, I was out playing soccer, uh, kicking the ball around, and uh, uh, started talking and uh, established that I was on the wrestling team, so, uh, he, he might have uh, had a drink or two, uh, had a drink or two at that time. He said, well, I'd like to wrestle with you. So uh, I uh, was able to, uh, he was quite a bit bigger than I was, but uh, I sort of could hold my own. And uh, so we wrestled on the grass uh, for maybe uh, five or 10 minutes. And uh, he said, oh, that's enough, we're ready. Let's uh, go back. The, the uh, group that I really have continuing contact with is um, DUs who live in New York probably from a uh, class of 61 or maybe 60 up to say 64. When there's a reunion or an event, um, I get on with a couple of other DUs and try to you know, rally and uh, every couple of years I have a reunion of all the ones who uh, live in the New York area and we come and have dinner in, in a restaurant in New York and that's always a lot of fun. I made the connection with the library and uh, somebody, uh, there was a general fundraiser came up and uh, uh, was talking about a couple areas and I, I was telling her about my uh, working at the library all the time I was at Cornell and uh, so she put me in touch with the head librarian Ann Kenny and uh, I've gotten uh, involved with the library since then and uh, have sponsored, uh, uh, last year sponsored a salon up here in, uh, in uh, Boston, uh, which is a sort of a semi-fundraiser. But I thought it would be a great way to keep in touch when they asked me if I would write the class column for the women. And uh, at that point, the men and the women were separated so there was a separate column for women and for men. Later, they became one correspondent. And I just kept on writing, enjoy it, enjoy hearing from people. Just before our 25th reunion, Frank Rhodes called a significant number of people in our class and invited us back to a dinner at his house. And he wanted us to make a commitment to go away and engage 25 of our classmates in some positive Cornell experience. We all did this and really from that time on I was back uh, in the fray doing all kinds of things with Cornell. I ended up working at Cornell. I first had a consulting assignment. I had some other positions in development uh, at Cornell then through uh, my uh, fraternity activities, I ended up buying a company called Stuart Howe Alumni Service that provides the uh, alumni affairs and development 
and fundraising for 40 or so fraternities and sororities at Cornell. One of the most wonderful things I got to do after I graduated and then when I became a reporter for the New York Times was that I got to come up to Cornell periodically. I was on the Agricultural College Advisory Council and I would come to Cornell and pull together a bunch of research stories that I could write about, about the kinds of research that, that's being done at the college. In 1990, we formed the President's Council of Cornell Women, which was an advisory council established by President Frank Rhodes uh, to help foster the Cornell experience for both women students and women faculty. Because I've been active in the Cornell Club of Central Ohio, I was uh, elected to the Cornell Council. I also was elected to uh, PCCW, which is the President's Council of Cornell Women. And uh, the, the women that meet once a year at PCCW are truly the most outstanding women I've ever met. I went to Cornell and did the keynote address at a mosaic conference where the school invited all of the minority alums to come back uh, to campus and share an experience with minority students who were there as kind of a celebration of the fact that they were now actually people of color at Cornell University. I went to see my fraternity, A.E. Pi. A.E. Pi had turned in to the Afro-American Center at Cornell. And I said, my heavens, isn't this poetic justice? Actually, I was, I was the reunion chairman for my first reunion. It's been a, a real, real um, experience to, to get back and see the campus and walk the grounds and go into the, um, into the football office and the locker rooms and smell, smell it. You know, it smells different. And there's no way, there's no smell like that anywhere. It's, um, I don't know, it's sweat. It's um, whatever, whatever it is that, that it, you can't duplicate it. And when you smell it, you, you, you feel it. You feel yourself being there like you never left. I enjoy cooking. I wrote three cookbooks. My uh, roommate, my freshman year, was Diane Teal Riddell. Uh, we're still good friends. I like doing it. I really do. And they've been gracious enough to let me keep doing it all these years. Mike, you're living the dream. And you know what? He's right. I water ski every summer. I love to do it. And we can do good water skiing on Cape Cod. Cornell continues to be a very important part of my life. I see something there that's aesthetically pleasing to me. I've continued to play poker. We still have a game in Boston that I've been playing in continuously since 1971. I've planted about 15 fruit trees in my yard. But there is one more thing. We had a class member who was in the Frosh Register and uh, his name was uh, Nar Narby Grimsnatch, no, Crimsnatch. Uh, Narby appeared in our yearbook, and uh, so he has recently been making appearances uh, on multiple occasions in multiple places. But there is one last thing. It isn't so much the fact of reaching the 50th reunion that's significant, as the fact that we turned 70. And that is absolutely dreadful. I can't even imagine being 70. And so I do not, I'm in total denial. <laughs>